Mm. And I'll start talking when I see that. So welcome everybody. Um, delighted to see so many people are joining this meeting um, because it is PERM, Product Implementation and Relationship Management, who are going to be talking to you about our change management toolkit. So my name's Jane Berezinski um, and I'm going, I'm going to give you a little bit of background as to why the change management toolkit. Um, I, there are other colleagues who will be talking you through certain things as well, and as they talk, they will introduce themselves as well. So why the PERM Change Management Toolkit? So it arose from an internal need. Um, we'd all gone on the APMG Change Management Pro, uh, Practitioners course. We were all dabbling using different change management tools and techniques. Uh, the change management expertise was kind of being used to support a very large scale organisational change within NHS Digital, so it was a large um, organisational redesign. So at that point, we felt like we had a lot of collateral in lots of different places, so we needed to bring it all into one place. Um, and at that point as well, we started recognising that it was a great tool for us but we also thought, what about the boundaries beyond NHS Digital? So if you flip to the next slide for me, please, Arlene. Um, so as we were thinking about NHS Digital, uh, beyond NHS Digital, we recognised that we'd got a toolkit. At that stage, it had over 70 mm -hmm. tools within it. We were using it uh, when guiding teams through change. Uh, so we had a bit of, we had an event with Health Education England, to whom we're, desperately grateful um, and we tested and validated the applicability of the change management toolkit. Um, that indicated that there was an appetite for such a tool, so we went back to talk to our colleagues in senior leadership positions in NHS Digital and we obtained sponsorship from them to build a web-based toolkit which is accessible free of charge to everyone in health and care organisations. Um, and as I've said, we, we kind of then identified a group of people who came to us with their needs um, and they gave us a, a number of use cases. So we worked with them through January to March to refine how the toolkit looked and what it did. And that's how we got to the change management toolkit that we've got today. So moving to the next slide, um, what is it then? So I've already said it's a change management toolkit. So, and I think that's quite important. It's a toolkit. It's not a prescriptive methodology that you follow slavishly from A through to Z. It is, a, its name suggests, mm -hmm. a toolkit that you can use when you're doing any sort of transformational activity, whether that's organisational transformation, digital transformation, or any other adjective in front of transformation. But where it differs is certainly in NHS Digital as an organisation, we're a tech organisation, so we're good at doing the tech, but actually you need to think about the people and the processes that are going to be using the tech, the people, and how it's going to change their job and how it's going to change what they do and how they do it. So this change management toolkit contains best practice change management guidance, and it's available, as I've already said, regardless of size, scale or complexity. And my colleagues will talk a little bit more about where we've used some of these tools. So who is it for then? Um, anybody who's doing change, anybody who is an agent of change, it doesn't matter what your level of knowledge and understanding is about change management. Uh, the tool will be suitable whether you classify yourself as a change novice or whether you think of yourself as a change sensei or change master. Um, and in the health world, but recognising that this is just not just about health, but in the health world, it's available to CIOs, CCIOs, programme and project managers. If you're lucky enough to have a change manager in your team, it's available for change managers and for business analysts. So I guess that begs the question, where is it and how can I get at it? 
So we created this NHS Futures Workspace. It's available to all. It says there it's growing rapidly, 102 weeks. I think our total at the moment is well over 230. We may be pushing at the 300 mark soon. Um, and when we demonstrate it, you will see that there are three key components to the NHS Futures site. There's absolutely the toolkit and its tools. But there's also a discussion forum because what we're, what we're really keen to do is to encourage a mutually supportive but vibrant community of practice for change managers and those people who are interested in change management. So there is also learning and support available through the, the NHS Futures site. And there is the link to the Futures site. I think we'll probably put it in chat as well, just so that people can pick it up and join if they haven't already done so. So moving on, I think we're going to now start a, a demonstration and that's going to be led by my two colleagues, James Kane and Arlene Morgan. Thank you, Jane. Okay. Let me just have to switch screen. While you're doing that, Arlene, can I just say that if anyone uses that link I've just posted in the chat now, um, that will uh, you'll be invited to join the forum. But until we come off this call, we won't be able to uh, approve that for you. So bear with us for a couple of hours if you can, please. <laughs> Sorry about this. Can't stop the presentation for some reason. Oh, the joy of technology. <laughs> OK, right. try again. It's just not coming up, sorry. I'll try again. Teams has been a little bit temperamental. And just say if you want one of one of mm. the other of us to share. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. I've got it. I can. Thank Very you. <clears throat> James, if I hand over to you. Yeah, thanks, Holly. So I'm James Kane, Implementation and Business Change Manager and it's Digital. So I'm going to take you through the network and also the toolkits. So uh, this is the landing page for the network on the NHS Futures site. So as Jane mentioned, it's a collaborative space for those interested in change management and as you scroll down, you'll be able to see on this landing page, we've got our headline news and then our list of members, which is around 230, which is great. And then, as Jane mentioned, there's those three key areas, um, the change management toolkit and its tools, which we'll go into shortly. We've got the discussion forum, so if we just click onto that. Yeah, so this is the space where members can start conversations and this could be anything to do with um, change management, whether it's maybe a tool or technique they're trying to use or a particular initiative. And by having that uh, community of practice, you can get others to comment and share ideas and contribute. And it's just a really good way um, of um, members networking. So um, if we go back, we've also got the learning and support area. So here we've got links and resources to get the most out of the toolkit and the change management approaches. So we'll be adding um, lots of good stuff here for you to check, some e-learning about change management. If we go back to the main menu, um, we've also recently added an events calendar um, for some future events that we'll be running to do with the toolkit and change management. And then as you scroll down, there's some information about the change uh, management network. So as we've stated before, it doesn't matter what, whether you're a seasoned change manager, uh, project manager unsure of what change activities to use or someone just interested in change management and just wanting to know more about it this is the place for you and if you do have any queries and about anything on the network we do have this um nhs digital perm dot change management at nhs.net so that is um uh, an, an address an email address you can use to uh, contact us and then as you scroll down um the the toolkit is actually based around this framework of changed phases. So you'll see this a bit more clearly when we go to the toolkit, but essentially um, 
there's different phases of change initiative, starting from when you're defining the change, doing that change vision and compelling case for change early on in phase one. And then as you move through the phases, you're preparing and planning the change, you're managing that implementation, and then post deployment, you are looking to reinforce and sustain the change. So there's different outputs within those phases, and within those within those there are activities and tools and techniques you can pick up and use. As we scroll down further on this landing page, on the left hand side we've got links to our NHS digital Twitter feed for um, the latest news and on the right hand side is a really useful video um, on YouTube just explaining about what change management is. So if you're new to it, it's a really great start to, to look at that video. And if you scroll down a little bit further, we've got our blog section. So there's been a recent blog about bridges transitions. So um, we're going to be adding more blogs um, here, just giving you in insight into various tools and techniques and aspects of change management, um, just to get to, to gather your interest in um, the different aspects of change management. Um, and if you scroll down further, to the change management tools folder. So what we're shortly going to show you is how to use the toolkit to access um, tools through that route. But once you're a member and you've used the toolkit, you're more familiar. Here's our repository. So once you're more more familiar, this is um, in alphabetical order. And if you know, for example, you want to use the benefits map, you can go straight to that folder and gain access to the tool that way. OK, so we'll go back to the landing page. And we'll go right to the top to the main menu area. And we're now going to go into the change management toolkit. So we're in the toolkit page and what you see when you first come onto this page is a preview of the toolkit. So it's just a quick reference, shows you the content within the toolkit, but it, you can't use it to actually click on any of the tools or techniques or to navigate around it. Um, in order to do that, you need to download and, and view the actual toolkit itself. So I'm just going to hand you over to Arlene now. It's going to take you through that process, how to actually access and use the toolkit. Thank you, James. So hello, everyone. I'm Arlene Morgan. I'm also um, Implementation and Business Change Manager. So I'm just going to take you through downloading the toolkit and just what it looks like um, if it, once we're in it. So just go to the top. So this is the actual toolkit and it is interactive. So if we scroll down, um, there is a page here that tells you how to use it. So we have buttons, uh, return to home, next slide, etc. And all of these are interactive, so you can click on them and go to the, the phases that you need to get to. So I'm just going to go down to some of the phases that James had explained um, about earlier. And I'm going to go to the pre-discovery, which is um, phase one, and just click on compelling case for change. So this takes me to that topic and each page will have an introduction um, telling you about that uh, topic and then any useful tips, any further reference reading from the change manager's handbook and uh, any website references will be listed also. You'll find at the bottom a list of key activities also. So if you click on any of those buttons, that will then take you to the tools. So I'm just going to go into number three, which takes me to that page. Again, you have some useful information, some useful tips, and any references you'll find at the bottom of the page. So these are the three tools um, for this activity. So I'm going to just click on force field analysis that takes me into that tool on the future NSA. NHS page. So each um, tool has the same layout. You have the what, what the tool is, when to use it, who it should be used by, the rationale for its usage, the why, how to use it, and if there are any additional files, templates, examples, these will be listed at the bottom. So I'm just going to quickly click into this template and there's the preview. I'm not going to actually open up the tool because James will demonstrate that in uh, further usage uh, later on in the presentation. So there's an example of what the tool looks like in Excel. And then you can open it up in Excel and then save it to your own desktops. So I'm just going to go back to the tool. If there are any additional references such as websites or further reading, you'll find them on the right hand side of the page that you can click into 
and get some further information. So I'm going to go back to the toolkit, click on the home page, and that takes me back to the summary uh, summary page. So now I'm going to just click on phase four and the change management plan executed button. Again, we have a nice introduction, some useful tips and the key activities. You have the two buttons at the bottom. So I'll click on the first one, which takes me into that page. So we have the two tools um, pertaining to this topic, change network and stakeholder analysis tool. So again, if you're interested in stakeholder analysis tool. If it will play. Click on that button and it takes you into the tool again. You'll start to get familiar with the layout. It's exactly the same as all of the others. This one has some additional reading from the Effective Change Manager's Handbook and the relevant pages for you to, to get some additional information. Again, we have some uh, examples which um, Emma will take you um, Emma will take you through um, later on in this presentation, so you can see exactly how to use them. And I'll just click out of that page which takes me back to the toolkit, click on the home button and I'm back to the beginning. So I just want to show you an example of um, how you can search because it's quite a powerful search engine in, in here. If you know exactly what, which tool you want to find, there's a, a magnifying glass at the top of the page. You click on that and I'm going to go for change impact. Change impact assessment. I didn't even need to put the full word, it's already found it. So if I click on that, it takes me into that tool. And again, all of the information is there for your reference. And Julie will take you through um, the usage of this in a bit more detail later on in this presentation. So I shall go back to the toolkit. And just show you one more. So click on the home button. And then we want to go to uh, phase two. And I want the third option. All my activities are at the bottom. And if I go to the last one, it takes me to the RACI matrix, which I will show you in a little bit more detail um, in my section of the presentation when we come back to um, these presentations. So I'm just going to hand over now to James, who's going to take you through the race, um, the force field analysis in a little bit more detail. So I'm going to stop sharing, James, and then you can take over. Thanks, Arlene. OK, can you see that force field? Yes, can see it. OK, great. So I'm just going to give you um, a bit of a demo of how you would use the force field analysis. So the force field analysis is a great tool to use early on in your change initiative, because what it does, it helps you look at the driving forces that are going to support your change. So this is particularly useful when developing your compelling case for change. As stakeholders, you can relay the message why it's important and the that urgent need for change. Um, but it's also really great at looking at resistance. So looking at those opposing forces so that you can address those early on and start putting in plans. So on the screen, I've just put an example for you. It's a cut down version. Um, and what you would do when you first um, start using this tool is you'd put in your change initiative in the middle. Um, so here I put the NPR implementation and an example organisation who is going to be undergoing this change initiative. And then you'd what we do is brainstorm it with stakeholders and you start to brainstorm and list the supporting forces and give them a rank from one to ten. So here I've put in that the current system or process is not fit for purpose, and that's quite a high score of eight. So they might be using a paper based system and they're trying to move to more more digital, more efficient uh, system with the, the latest information about patients at the, at the fingertips of the uh, clinicians and the staff that are going to use the system. So that's quite an urgent need to change that. And also there's a mandate for EPR levelling up, so that's going to be driving um, the need to change and get that um, maturity level um, of that organisation higher. So that's been ranked quite quite high as well. So those are some of the supporting forces. Obviously there'll be a lot more when you do this um, work, but um, just showing you as an example today. And then on the right hand side are the opposing forces. So you start to brainstorm and list those um, that you think are going to hinder the change. So I've put here at the top quite high uh, 
nine out of 10 lack of change champions and role models. So maybe this organization hasn't started looking at the sponsorship and who's going to be supporting the change. Uh, maybe they've not started the change network yet. So that's an area that um, needs to be addressed. The change management capability is is low. So that's been scored as a seven out of 10. So within this organization, um, possibly they haven't got that uh, capability within the organization in terms of using change management. Um, the vision of the future state is unclear. Um, so there might be some work that's not been done yet. There might be quite a lot of feedback from um, users within the organization that they, they're not quite sure why the change is happening. So that vision is not clear clear yet so there might be some work to be done there and then historically changes have not gone gone well so that's been scored an eight out of ten so um there might be some previous experiences with um implementations where there's been a lot of pain and um, some resistance and things could have gone better so that's um been identified as well as a resisting force so once you've scored your supporting and opposing forces um as you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see that's giving you an overall score of 17 for supporting forces and 30 for uh, resisting forces. So it's giving you a, an overall score of minus 13. So it's showing you those restraining forces are higher than the supporting forces. So it's indicating that this change at this moment in time, um, it's not going to be um, as successful as you want it to be. What, what you can do is you can start to address things through an action plan. So you can use the action plan in this tool to start maybe increasing those supporting forces or reducing those opposing forces. So when I click on this action plan, what's really good about this tool is any forces you input on that previous tab automatically appear in column B. So in this particular instance, I want to really look at those things on the right hand side and start reducing those resisting forces. So I've already started to plan here and started to address them by putting in some actions against those resisting forces. So to address the lack of change champions and role models, I'm going to conduct a sponsor assessment to identify who must actively support, incentivize and reinforce the plan change. I'm going to start forming a change network. I've got a change. I've got an owner for this and I've got a date and I'm using a brag status as well. So I've marked it as red. Change management capa capability is low. So to, to, to address this re um, opposing force, I'm going to start developing leadership. I'm going to start embedding change management into projects in my organization. I'm going to start training staff in change management and creating a change management office. Um, again, added to an owner, this is going to be more of a longer term objective, but it's, it's going to help by starting the ball rolling. And I've marked it as amber. The vision of the future state is, is unclear. So to address this, I'm going to start by arranging a vision setting workshop to start defi defining that vision and then communicating that to staff. Again, adding the owner, the date and the brag status. And finally, historically changes have not gone well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to conduct a change impact assessment. This will help me understand better how the change is going to impact those various stakeholder groups so I can manage that change and how it lands with the different stakeholders much better than I've done previously. So again, given an owner, a date and a status. So what you hopefully see from this is that I've done that analysis work and I've put an action plan together. And what you can do, and it's really useful, is you can take this first analysis work you've done as a baseline, and hopefully in your action plan, as you start to progress, plan these actions and start implementing, you might start to see some results. So this red might become an, um, an amber, this one might become a green, this one might, might become an amber as well. And then you can come back to your force field analysis and you've, you've done your baseline, you come back to it, say a month later, and you've started to see that those actions you put in place are starting to take effect. So you've put that change network in place. You've got those change champions and role models in your organization. So that's now a six. Change management capability is low. That's taken a bit longer. So it's just a six, but it still has come down a bit. That vision has now been defined. It's been communicated to um, all the stakeholders group groups, they know what's in it for me and um, things are much better. So that's a three and historically changes have not gone as well. So I've done my change impact assessment and some of that starting to have an impact and that's down to a five now. As, if I scroll down now, I can actually see that um, it's still a minus score, but it's much better than it was before. Those restraining forces have come down and um, the picture is looking much brighter. So as those actions um, start to 
get implemented implemented further, you'll start to see the overall score change into a positive score, and that's going to mean your, your change initiative has much more chance of being successful. OK, so that's a quick run through of the force field analysis and how to use it. So I'm just going to hand you back now and stop presenting. I'll pass you on to our next um, presenter who's going to present the next demo. I think that's me, James. That's Emma. <clears throat> OK. There we go. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. OK. So hello, my name is Emma Hart. I'm an IBC manager at NHS Digital and I'll be taking you through the stakeholder analysis tool, which I've got open here. Uh, this is used in phase one pre-discovery. And uh, the example I'm using is clinical, uh, implementing a clinical system into an A&E setting. So we use stakeholder analysis when you need to identify who your key stakeholders are, what impact they have on the project and what capacity they have to embed, the act, embed or action the change. Um, and what actions you need to complete to bring the people through you, bring the people with you through the project, I should say. Um, you'll need to repeat this activity regularly, regularly throughout your project. Stakeholders will change depending on where you are in the project and who it impacts. And more importantly, their commitment and capability will also change as your engagement activities take effect. So we'll need to update it as the change initiative progresses. Um, a change manager will typically uh, do the lead the analysis or a group of change managers um, and why engage your stakeholders so if you don't identify your key stakeholders for each stage of the change project you'll lose impact and the opportunity to influence early and the project could fail and the intended change may not embed so by identifying key stakeholders and the influence they'll have on the project you'll create a more streamlined embedded and harmonious outcome and this tool will allow you to identify stakeholders and structure activities to get the best out of each stakeholder so how do we do it? Um, the guidance tab, which is on the screen at the moment, is the most important tab. Um, it'll take you through each of the steps that you need to complete the analysis. Read each step accurately and carefully. Um, the formulas on each tab link to the next one, so that will have an impact of what you put on each tab will follow on to the next one. Um, so we'll start with the reference data tab. So each step in the guidance has a what and why and a how. And the reference data tab is um, looking at, uh, we'll po partially populate in the details tab. So we'll move to the reference data tab. Um, and I have in here, I've pre populated some typical staff in a, in a hospital, AE department in the functional group. And Julie's got some notes on here to say um, a description of what, the, what, what to put in this functional group. And the same for the location, I've got general hospital and hospital HQ and the departments, typical departments you find in a hospital and the relationship categories. So we've based it on CPIC here, so customer provider, influencer and governance. And um, it just mentions you can add your own, um, add your own categories here. or you can use the ones that we've given you. So moving along to the detail tab. So the first thing I would say to do is go back to the guidance tab and have a, have a, a read of the detail tab because this is the most important one. It's got the what and why here and it's got the how and there's a number of steps that you've got to do first. So completing columns A and F first, followed by completing columns G and M and then moving further down with each. Each has got descriptions in here as well. So if we go to the detail tab, I've pre-populated it again. So you can see columns A to F have got um their names in the functional groups the locations from the drop down they've all got drop downs in here um the department and the relationship and what i thought they should be so uh, joe blogs is an sro um based at hospital headquarters and the relationship is governance um so i've completed this for all of the the um stakeholders and the next section would be to complete columns g to m so each of these are um, categories based on interest, impact, power and influence. And you can see that the SRO has got very high, very high and very high and very high. And if I change that to very to low and change that to low, you'd see that the stakeholder mapping here would change. So I'll change those back to high. Very high, sorry. And I'll fill out Hermione Granger, who is a consultant and is a customer. So we'll put them in as very high. And you can see the stakeholder mapping is changing. 
very high, very high, and very high. So we have to keep them actively engaged. So the next step on the guidance tab would be to complete columns W and Y, and these are the, the target change. So you're looking at their target of their commitment and their capability at a later date. So once the change is embedded. So we'll put the commitment in as leading and we'll put the capability in as practice. And this is what I've done for the other stakeholders here as well. And well, the next column is to add in to the target date. So I'll just put a target date in here. And then we go back and look at how they are facing the change at the moment. So the consultant might not even be aware, you know, what is their commitment? Are they even aware of the change at the moment? Do they know what's coming? Are they resistant? Are they opposed? Are they complying? We'll put them in as complying. And the capability, you know, where do we expect them to be at the moment? Are they aware? Are they informed? I think we'll put them as aware. So you can see in here the change gap produces um, capability steps and commitment steps that need to be undertaken to get um, your stakeholders up to power. So we've completed those ones and we'll move on to the analysis map tab. So we'll just pop back to the guidance tab to see. Uh, in step three is the analysis map tab. So we've got a what and why here again and a how just detailing what the uh, analysis map um, does. So the analysis map, go back to that screen, um, plots your details tab results. It will group your stakeholders into a pivot table uh, working on an interest impact versus power influence uh, grid axis. Sorry, The table divides into, into four categories, low, medium, medium, uh, high and very high, sorry. If an individual is high or very high on both axes, they'll have the potential to be extremely influential to your change, either positively or negatively. So it's important to identify those stakeholders which need to be managed in order to produce the most positive influence on the change. So we'll just make sure we refresh the data in this, um, in this analysis map. And if we double click on the very high, it produces another sheet down here. And it gives you the list of your very high stakeholders. And these are the ones that will have to be informed um, of the change. And, you know, these are your influencers. So this is detailing that they are on here as well. If we pop back to the analysis map and we just do a medium, medium, um, it will pop up with the nursing staff. So functional group of nurses, they're the nursing staff as a group name. And this is the level of power, uh, interest, impact and power influence that they have. So just moving along to the activities tab. Once you've defined your stakeholders and categorised them, you'll need to look at which activities will support you in influencing and engaging them with them in the change. Um, the activities tab will enable you to list which methods of engagement you want to use and at what times you want to use them. Um, so looking at the list we've got here, there are a number of things that can be used to offer engagement. For instance, a newsletter will be an informative tool where a, a workshop session or a face-to-face -face meeting will be a collaborative tool to consult and empower stakeholders. So there's different ways of using different uh, engagement activities. Um, once again, I cannot stress enough to read the guidance many times in order to get the most out of this template. So if we look at the guidance for activities as well, it's got a numerous a what and why and, and a how, and it's got numerous steps that you should follow. And it also tells you the description before what is, is classing, informing stakeholders and consulting stakeholders uh, and so on and so forth. So that is really useful. Um, thank you. I will now pass over to my colleague Judy Wright for the next tool. Thank you, Emma. Hello, everyone. My name's Julie Wright. I'm one of the uh, senior implementation and business change managers within NHS Digital's PERM team and new to the organisation in my second week. I'm just going to share my screen with you now. Uh, just bear with me one second. Please tell me if you can see the screen. Yes. Lovely. Thank you, Arlene. 
OK, so uh, what I wanted to talk to you about is the change impact assessment tool. Um, and it's one of the tools that we would use in phase two of our solution and design. Um, and what I wanted to demonstrate to you today is where it could be used in a sort of a change programme. Um, and what I've opted to use is within a ICS and about a virtual ward programme. But before we get to that, I just wanted to bring your attention to this first tab on the screen here. And this is the um, guidance to completing the detailed impact assessment. It's very straightforward and has all of the steps there and gives you some general narrative on on what we're going to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dive straight into the um, detailed impact assessment for you. OK, so hopefully what you can see on my screen is the detailed impact assessment and down the left hand side, what I've got for you is a number of um, business functions that could be potentially involved in this change program for an ICS when developing a virtual ward. Um, so they're all listed there. It's not a complete list. You may have other stakeholders that come on board at a future state thinking about trust pharmacies, etc. So just thinking about that. And then for column B, what we're trying to do here is demonstrate to you that there will be a number of processes that are to be defined within that um, change process. And you can see those there from uh, the referral route into the virtual ward and things like the daily MDT. Um, and in this next column here, the column C, which is the process reference, this is linking you to that sort of future state process. Um, and we would possibly have an identification code there for you to track that. Um, and then we would have potentially a benefits um, reference and this may link back to something that you've already got within your if you've developed some dependence benefits dependency and benefits mapping tools um, for the area of change. And when we look at the impact of that process in column E here. This is about the um, potential impact within that area of the number of people that could be impacted by it, which is really important when you're looking across organisational wide change to get an understanding of what that's looking like. And again, another area that can help you with this is when you're looking at when it's going to be impacted. For example, across the whole year, you can actually see um, the months that are populated there. What I wanted to do now is talk about um, the process complexity in terms of that, how far away or not we are from the um, change process. I want to talk to you using two examples. I'm going to use my complex community practitioner service and also the acute frailty team within that um, virtual ward scenario. Um, so potentially what I'm saying here is we've got a scoring of four and if you click on these little tabs up here you can actually see that the scoring four is saying that the daily MDT is highly complex and it's a specialist activity. And you can do that for all of the other business functions within that area. When we're looking at process frequency, you can see for both of these business functions, I've actually scored them a three um, because what I'm saying here is this is something that's going to be happening on a daily basis. Again, the little tab up here gives you the scoring sheet in terms of where you get that figure from. And then at this last column here in this section in column I, we have the distance from that current process. 
So for example, on here, I've scored our complex community practitioners as a three and the acute frailty team as a one. So you might be wondering what my rationale is for that. So if I talk about the complex community practitioners, if you think about in a community setting, they're regularly reviewing those patients and having discussions with other services as and when that is required to understand that patient. However, when you compare that to potentially an acute trust who might be already doing something very similar, they will be having ward rounds, they'll be having daily MDTs with specialist services within, within the organisation. But what's different here is that it might actually be that wider organisational MDT with that patient centred focus around it. So from a system perspective, you're having a system wide organisational MDT, which is which is different. And then you can see how those figures start to develop that changing score. Um, and you can see that red, amber, green in terms of where those business functions are, in terms of that business process change. You can see where each of them are. What I wanted to do next is talk to you about the attitudes towards that change in terms of that developing our way to understanding this readiness score here. So if I go back to my complex community practitioners that I've highlighted here, you can see I've highlighted them as a score four. And if I look at my little tab up here at the top, we can see that score four is telling me that these services business functions are very positive towards the change. So they're pulling towards that change. Now, when I look at conditions and conditions is about understanding what might divert or not from that change. And I'm scoring here. I've got a three for the complex community practitioners. I'm saying that there might be a few minor changes that may impact. And for our acute frailty team, I'm saying that there might be one major change that might impact on their readiness towards that. In terms of resources for these two teams that I'm demonstrating here, you can see it's a score of two. And I'm saying here that they're that the function is sufficiently resourced to continue with the change. When I get to understanding the change network and the sort of capability for that, what I'm saying here in terms of the complex case practitioners is they are ready in terms of the change network, but in terms of having those change agents within the business function, they're not quite ready. In comparison, then we have the acute frailty team who were saying within that area, they are fully resourced to to enable us to understand that. And then this final column here on this detailed impact assessment then is showing a sort of a rag status and a percentage in terms of that overall, which is really important when you're looking at that sort of organisation system wide understanding of where this change is going to impact or not. Uh, so if I just quickly take you to our next tab on on the toolkit is the business readiness tab. And this is just showing me at a glance from across that ICS who's developing that virtual ward change program. You can see each of those business functions that we've identified in terms of where they are in terms of that readiness and any new services that you bring online. Obviously, then that would mm. populate into that. So the next bit around that is understanding that organisational impact summary. So what I want to do now is take you into the organisational impact summary. Just a health warning here. Um, it's not based on real data. It's something that sort of we've put together. Um, but a few things to understand here. When you're looking at that wider organisational impact, it's to understand those activities that might be occurring during this particular change period to to understand really where there might be some 
pressures, etc. So looking at the table here, you can see at the very start here in January, February, when the when the work is beginning, there's an increased demand in that service because of their regular day to day work, but actually in the middle of winter. Um, so those winter pressures, they're developing a new way of understanding that work and also still in potentially a level four. And then if you think about later in the year, again over here, December, November, December time, again, the impact could be very high because again, thinking around planning for those winter pressures, etc. But again, there's something else going here on this heat map. So over in June, etc. for this particular example that I'm using here, there could be something around that ICS completing and developing their final strategy in terms of that virtual ward for the for that ICS and that could actually impact on those services. But actually there's a few other things that you know for consideration in terms of what might be a challenge in terms of that system wide perspective. So June, July, August time, thinking about those different service functions in terms of things like holidays and the impacts on their workforce. And I really like this slide because it helps you to get to start thinking about. So what are those dependencies across that wider system when you're considering that change and thinking about whether or not you can leverage some of those change activities to schedule around some of that program and this just gives you that sort of overall analysis to help you understand the context in terms of that wider that wider change and where it's hitting all of those business areas in different ways and obviously each of those organizations are going to have those different organizational pressures which which you need to sort of take account of so again as i say i really like that slide that's really good and in terms of that just to generally illustrate that sort of overall impact assessment for you in terms of that organisational or that system. We then have a couple of um, tools that you can use graphical wise and we've got the line chart here which just quickly demonstrates for you and again also we have the um, stacked column which is actually showing again where some of those pressures are for you. Um, so thank you very much for listening in relation to the impact assessment tool and I will now hand you back to the team. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Julie. That's back to me. So I'm just going to very quickly go through the. Um, I find my toolkit take you through the RACI matrix. Um, so I'll just show you what this looks like. So from the toolkit, we have a RACI matrix um, spreadsheet in Excel. I'm just going to open that up very quickly. Can you see my screen, everyone? Is that you can see the Excel file? Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Yes. OK, so so the first tab. No. Arlene, we can't see the Excel file at the minute. OK, you can just see the uh, the change network. Right, bear with me. Let's try that again. Yep, is we're that, in now. Fantastic, thank you. So RACI, what does it stand for? The R is uh, responsible. These are the doers of the, the task. The A is accountable, so the, the person that the responsibility lies with. Um, this is usually the SRO, the CCIO or CIO um, for each task. And there's only ever one person that's accountable for, for each task. The C is consulted, so these stakeholders, they, they want to be consulted before any uh, action or decision is made and informed. So these stakeholders will want to be consulted after an action or decision has been made. And so the RACI helps to uh, clarify roles, responsibilities, and just as important, governance. Um, and it's useful to establish these during the solution design phase um, of, a, an, of a change 
programme and then revisit it during the development um, phases. So I'm just going to quickly, we have a pre-populated RACI example here and it's taken from an EPR procurement and implementation change initiative. So on the um, left hand side, you have the stages and the tasks, and these are probably taken from what well, they can be taken from the project plan. You have your list of roles going across the top, and then if you have a named person, you would input those as well. So um, there is no confusion as to whose role um, it's pertaining to. So just to talk you through each row, just the top few, we have um, approved end stage boundaries. So the the accountable person, as I said, there is only one, is that the SRO. And then um, the chief exec, there's an I there, they want to be kept informed. And the doers, these are the people responsible. Now, if I wanted to include another job role, I would just simply insert a column, type in, if you know, if, if I needed um, the chief pharma, um, information uh, pharmacy officer or, you know, whichever job title, you would, you would put that in there. And then you would just insert, OK, they want to they are responsible for um, approving the end stage boundary. So you put an R in there. And then that will change the colour for you and you do exactly the same for all of the tasks um, in in the, uh, the matrix, remembering that there is only ever one person who's accountable across each row. And it's, it's simply just just working through um, each person's roles and responsibility. And for your information, there is also a RACI template, which is blank for you to pre-populate with for your change initiative. OK, so I'm going to stop presenting. I'm going to go back to the presentation, so bear with me. Uh, oh, wrong one, sorry. Can you see that? Can you see my screen? We can, yeah. Fantastic. OK, so we just wanted to quickly go through some of our favourite tools and techniques. And um, so the first one being Bridges. And this is a good tool because it uh, focuses on transition and not the change. And it's what happens in people's minds as they go through a change. And it, it highlights three stages and we have a very uh, interesting blog on the Futures NHS side that you can have a read um, at your leisure. The next one is the change network and this ties in with the RACI matrix and it's important to involve people from across the organisation. Um, and so the change network is made up of change champions and change agents and it assists in um, how to engage with them and how to come up with some actions. So the process gap analysis is another one, and this ties in with the change impact assessment that Julie went through, and it helps to highlight what is current and what is to be, and it will help the organisation to create um, an action plan to gain successful change. The benefits discovery and mapping, we have a whole presentation on available on this in this area um, to help you to run a discovery workshop and to do some mapping. And then finally, celebrate success. No matter how small, it's really, really helpful for the team to celebrate all the successes that you have within your change initiative. Thank you. And I'm going to hand over now to next steps, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. So um, my name is Julie Atkins. I'm a principal relationship manager within um, products implementation and relationship management. And I have the pleasure of heading up this fabulous team um, and all the work that has been done on the change management toolkit. So thank you. The feedback's been brilliant. If you've not already done so, and I have to say that most, more than 60 people on this call have already requested to join the, the, uh, the platform, which is great, then please do join us on that um, future NHS platform. Share the link with relevant members of your team and people in your organisation. But please join us um, in building what we want uh, to be a vibrant community of practice, because some of the comments that we've been getting throughout have been um, around, this is great, but how does it work for us? And what we really need to know is how it is working for you, because um, 
we're not in the position of of running a, a, a trust change initiative or a, a GP practice um, initiative. We can't have the experiences that you can have. So please share your experiences because they're going to be invaluable um, for other people. And invite us to share our passion, which you may have gathered for change management and the toolkit at regional ICS events, meetings, anywhere that you think we can um, help to, to spread the joy of change management. Thank you. Um, Arlene, the next slide, please. So what we're doing in the meantime, um, Sonia Patel as the system CIO has commissioned us to deliver a change management support uh, offer to frontline digitization levelling up. So you may be aware that there are a number of organisations that don't have an EPR and the Secretary of State has said that they must have one by December 23. Um, so that's a, a big ask for lots of trusts. And um, we're really excited by the fact that, um, that Sonia Patel sees the relevance of change management in that because implementing an EPR is only as good as the people and the adoption uh, people that, that use it and use it appropriately. So we're doing lots of stuff um, around that at the moment, but we're also offering universal support. So as you can see, um, the, the toolkit's available to anyone in health and care um, to support organisations. We can help with some training, coaching, engagement, um, whether it's large or small, and we're we're open to ad hoc support or potential commissions as we've had with, uh, with frontline digitisation. Now I'm going to um, I'm going to stay on this call for anyone that wants to ask any questions, but I will um, ask my team to leave, please, because they're just about to now present exactly the same presentation, but a cut down version for um, digital first primary care in uh, NHS England. So thank you very much, ladies and gent, and uh, and I'll stay on for um, for questions. One of them being what's EPR? Sorry, electronic patient record. Gemma, thank you. So it's um it's how the trusts run their electronic patient records. Someone has a has a hand raised. Who's that? Sorry, um, I'm struggling to see. Yashoda Patel, do you want to ask your question, please? No, any other questions that we haven't been able to answer in the chat? Yes, you will have access to the recording. So Sophie will, will make the recording available. Chris, you have a question. Apologies, it was my question, so you already answered that. So thanks a lot. <laughs> it was great. Thank you very much. For us. OK, thank you. And how do you access the toolkit? I'll put the link in again because it's always difficult, isn't it? If you if you miss it, first of all, then um, you can't always see the stuff that that's going on that went previously. So I will put the link to the um, to the toolkit back in the chat. Um, hello, hello. Hi, Hi, sorry. So sorry, my team has, oh, my computer has broken down. Oops. Hello? Can Hello? just about hear you. Hello? Hello? I think we can hear you, but you can't hear us. Uh, one moment. So Rochelle, thank you. Um, as a graduate business change manager, this is exactly what you need. Please um, contact us if we can help. Uh, yeah, sorry about this. Sorry, my teams on my computer literally crashed as I tried to um, unmute myself. Okay. <laughs> um, and I'm just trying to do it from my phone. Um, just in terms of the change management support, are you focused on specifically the EPR? No. Or is it a broader sort of offer around process oh, improvement and digitalization? It, it's it's a it's a broader offer, but our commission is for the EPR. So we've currently got um, we're being funded to deliver that EPR leveling up, but yep. we have a team that that has change expertise that could be helpful to other organisations. 